Hi, everyone. Good evening and welcome to our special presentation here from the Brown Planetarium at Ball State University. I'm Dana Thompson, the director of the planetarium here, and I'm joined with two special guests from NASA, not in Muncie, Indiana, where Ball State is located, um, but from quite a bit away. And they're here to talk about NASA's return to the moon. We have Patricia Moore here, who is the communication specialist for the Artemis program, and our featured speaker here, Andy, um, who is a NASA civil servant at Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas. But he didn't always live in Houston. He lived a little bit closer to Muncie, Indiana, again, where Ball State is located here, uh, where I'm at. Um, he is from Cincinnati, Ohio. Isn't that right, Andy? That is correct. Um, I did. I am a student pilot and I've got about 33 flight hours uh, in my logbook and I've actually landed at Delaware County Airport in Muncie so that was one of my one of my cross country flights over to Muncie so um, I have a, a little bit of a connection to to y'all there in Muncie so thanks Dana let me go ahead and share my screen and we can get going. And just to verify, you can see my screen. Absolutely. Yep. Looks good. Excellent. All right. So thanks again, Dana, and, and welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining us this evening. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, NASA's Artemis program, specifically the Gateway program. Uh, going to talk a little bit about camping, a little bit about tennis balls, and a little bit about orbital mechanics, So and a little bit about me. Um, as Dana said, I am a civil servant at NASA Johnson Space Center. I was the former IT liaison to the Gateway Program, and I currently am serving a work detail to Kennedy Space Center as the deputy manager of the KSC Configuration Management Program. Uh, before all that, I was an ISS flight controller, uh, the Pluto position, plug-in plan utilization officer, Basically, I was tech support for the astronauts, the computers, and the networks on the space station. But we are here to talk about uh, the Gateway program and Artemis. So let's get going. Uh, so what is Gateway? Uh, the, the, the quickest way that I can describe it is a small space station around the moon. Uh, NASA is leading the development of the Gateway. It's an orbital outpost that will be a staging point for human and robotic exploration in deep space. And it's gonna serve as a test bed for our technologies that we will be using to explore deep space onto Mars. And I get this question a lot from my friends who know that I work at NASA. They, they ask me, they're like, why, why, are we, why are we going to the moon instead of going directly to Mars? Um, that's a great question. So let me answer that question with a story. Um, when I was a kid growing up, um, I would always go into my grandparents' attic, and there was this huge, heavy canvas tent up there, and I always wanted to go camping. So I'd ask my grandparents when I'd go over there, I was like, Grandma, Grandpa, can I go camping in the backyard? And sure, they said sure. So we would get the tent out, we'd set it up in the backyard. And we were literally only seconds from, from the, the back door. So if anything were to go wrong or start raining or we needed anything, we were literally seconds away from what we needed. Um, as I grew older, I, I wanted to, to branch out a little bit. So I did some camping a little bit further away at state parks. Um, by that time, I had a nice, uh, a nice lightweight tent that I could take with me. I was a few hours away from home. I could still get to places, uh, but it would take me a little while. So if I needed something, it would, it would take like an hour drive or something to get there. Um, and now, a few years ago, I actually did some hiking in the Superstition Mountains out in Arizona. And I was literally days from civilization. So if I needed anything or if something went wrong, it would take me days to get to where I could get some help. So you can think about that story of camping, sort of like what we do at NASA. Um, we take our systems, our tents, the systems that we build for spacecraft, and we'll test them in the library. And those are only a few seconds away from things that we need. 
Um, once we think we have everything ready to go, then we'll test them in space. So we'll take them to the International Space Station, which with our current spacecraft, it really only takes about an hour. Depending on orbital mechanics, when we launch, when the space station is in a specific spot in its orbit, can take about an hour to get there, a couple hours to get there, a couple hours to get home. The next step is the moon. Um, so we want to go to the moon so that we can take those reasonable risks while, while our astronauts are just a few days from home. It it's, takes a little bit of time, but we're building those spacecraft and testing those systems so that we can get back safely in a few days. These will prove the technology to mature those systems so that we can live and work on another world before we embark on that multi-year journey to, to Mars. Um, so let's talk a little bit about Artemis. Um, if you know your space history, you know that the program that took humans to the moon back in the 60s and 70s was called Apollo. And if you know your Greek mythology, you know that Apollo was the god of you know, pretty much everything. But up until probably a few months ago, I didn't know this, but Apollo had a twin sister and her name was Artemis and she was the goddess of the moon. So Artemis personifies our path to return to the moon and to the lunar surface. Uh, when they land on the moon, the Artemis astronauts will step foot where no human has ever went before. And that's the lunar South Pole. So um, as it, as they say, it takes a family, it takes a family of organizations at NASA uh, to help us get back to the moon and return astronauts to the lunar surface. Uh, what you see here are some of the components uh, that make up the Artemis program. So right now we have the Space Launch System, which is our big rocket or SLS. It's right now in the Vehicle Assembly Building down at the, floor, uh, the Kennedy Space Center in Florida getting ready to launch on our first mission around the moon, Artemis 1. Orion, the Orion spacecraft, which will take our astronauts around the moon and to the gateway. That's also right now Kennedy Space Center. Once we get to the moon and around the moon, we're going to need some systems to land on the moon. That's the human landing system or HLS. While we land, after we land on the moon, we're gonna do some surface operations. So we're gonna go out, we're gonna explore, we're gonna do science. Um, obviously we need a, a home away from home. That's the gateway in lunar orbit. Um, in order to help build and integrate and test and launch all of those components, we need our folks at the Exploration Ground Systems or EGS. Uh, in order to communicate with our astronauts uh, on the way to the moon and while in lunar orbit on the surface, we need space communications and navigation or SCAN. Um, after we've done our surface operations or during our surface operations, when we want to go further, we're going to need surface mobility. So think lunar rovers. Uh, obviously, we need spacesuits or mini, mini spacecraft you can think of to do that exploration on the lunar surface. And eventually we're gonna build the Artemis base camp for longer exploration on the lunar surface. So this is a, a notional timeline of landing the humans on the moon. Um, right now we do have the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, LRO. Uh, we are mapping, we've mapped the surface of the moon. We're looking at those landing sites, scientists are or identifying those sites, doing site investigation to see where we can land. We also need to use some robotics to land on the South Pole of the Moon to, to verify those, those, uh, those assumptions and those, those hypotheses. We're using our commercial lunar payload services or CLIPS providers. We're helping build those, those uh, services and infrastructure at a commercial level so if anybody else wants to do lunar exploration other than NASA, there is infrastructure and services that can help them do that. While that system is going to be static, uh, we also have the Volatiles Investigating Polar Exploration Rover or Viper. That's being designed and developed and built here at the Johnson Space Center in Houston and in the, at the Ames Research Center in California. So that's going to be a rover that's gonna be able to do longer robotic missions and exploration to check out the landing sites. Uh, 
Uh, as I stated, Artemis 1 is the first human spacecraft, the Orion, that's going to go around the moon in the 21st century. That is being stacked as we speak, and we are pushing towards a uh, December of this year launch. Can't wait to see that. Uh, Artemis II will be the first humans to orbit the moon and the first deep space rendezvous in the 21st century. Um, while that's happening, Gateway will launch and start uh, spiraling out to the lunar orbit. Uh, we're going to do science operations on the way to the moon with the power and propulsion element and the habitation and logistics outpost. And then finally, Artemis III through V are going to be our deep space crew missions and they're gonna demonstrate the landing with the human landing system. Before we do that though, we are going to do an un, what's called an uncrewed uh, human landing system demonstration. So we're gonna test all of the landing systems, make sure they are safe for our Artemis crew on Artemis three through five. So this is the Artemis gateway. It's a platform for to establish sustained human presence on and around the moon. Um, if you've seen the NASA administrator speak, uh, we're talking about a sustainable lunar presence. So unlike the, the one or multiple missions that went to the moon and just came back in, in the 60s with the Apollo program with Artemis and the Gateway, we are building the infrastructure for sustainable lunar exploration. Uh, it provides a way station for those vehicles like Orion, like HLS, um, and others in what's called cislunar or around the moon space. Uh, it also provides access to the lunar surface. Um, the gateway will contain living quarters for astronauts and infrastructure for science and research. And all of the components are being built by commercial US companies and our international partners. Um, and again, another slide, why, why Gateway? Um, again, it provides that vital support for the sustaining long-term human return to the lunar surface. Um, we are doing some really innovative things with systems and the way that we procure our hardware, which means purchase our hardware and integrate it. Um, if you've watched any of the NASA TV in the last few weeks, you might've seen the ISS rollout solar arrays being deployed or IROSA. Those are the same technology that will actually be used on the gateway. So again, going back to the camping story, we're doing that test on ISS so that we can use that technology on the gateway. We're also using solar electric propulsion, which I'll talk to a little bit later. Um, and we're, we're doing innovative things about, you know, buying and procuring those services and, and elements for the gateway. Uh, I always tell people we need every type of person at NASA. So if you love space, uh, but your math isn't that, that great, or you are a graphic designer, but you love space, we not only do we need scientists, engineers, technologists, mathematicians, we also need those folks who are interested in finance and accounting and those folks that are drawing the, the and designing the images that you're seeing here on the slide. So we need all of those folks. If you are interested in an internship at NASA, that's the way that I started my career as a non-traditional intern when I was 43. Um, go to intern.nasa.gov and check out the internships there. Uh, I'll have my contact information later on in the, in the presentation. And if you have any questions at all on what an internship involves or how to become an intern, feel free to reach out and contact me. Um, so we're going to do a little bit of um, astrodynamics. So get your, get your physics at books out, folks, and remember your, your high school or junior high school geometry. Okay. So the, the way that Gateway is going to orbit the moon is different from any other way that we've done it before. Um, and imagine that this is a, um, this is not green tennis ball, this is the moon. Um, so when we went back, when we went to the moon in the 60s and 70s, we went in what's called a low lunar orbit. So it's a, a low orbit, it's very close to the surface of the moon. 
Um, it takes about two hours to go around the moon and we went around the moon at the equator. So just like the earth, the moon has an equator. So we went basically, if you cut the moon in half along the horizon, that's the equator. So it's very stable. It was easy for us to get there. Uh, and that's what we used because that's, that's the technology we had at the time. For the Artemis 1 mission, we're going to be using what's called a distant retrograde orbit. So you had low lunar orbit, which was close. You have a distant retrograde orbit, which means it's distant. So it's further away. So it's going to take about two weeks to orbit around the moon. Um, a retrograde orbit, you can think of as backwards. So even though we only see one side of the moon when we look up at night, the moon is actually rotating. It's what's called tidally locked to the Earth. And we always see this side of the moon, but it is rotating. So if the, if the moon is rotating like this, a retrograde orbit will go the opposite way. So that's what a distant retrograde orbit is. Gateway is going to use a new fancy orbit. Uh, it's going to be what's called a halo orbit. So a halo orbit is very elliptical. And like I said, if you remember back to your junior high or high school geometry, an ellipse, a circle is just a special form an, of an ellipse. So this is going to be very elliptical. It's going to be called a near rectilinear halo orbit, or N-R-H-O. That's a mouthful. Uh, basically, it means that we're going to orbit around the poles of the moon very in a very elliptical way, which means that one part of the orbit is going to be very close to the moon. Another part is going to be very far away from the moon. Um, what that allows us to do is we're, we're orbiting the poles so we can always look back at the Earth. If we do a, an equatorial orbit or around you know, a lunar, low lunar orbit, um, we go around to the back side of the moon or the far side. And that means that we can't talk to the Earth. We can't see it, so we can't talk to it. Um, NRHO allows us to actually see the Earth almost all the time and almost have constant communication with Earth. So that's a, that's a favorable vantage point for us to do science, Earth observation, lunar observation, as well as solar observation. Uh, it gives us that full communication path it also gives us the ability to land almost anywhere on the moon. Um, like I said, we're going to the south pole of the moon. That's our landing spot for Artemis. Uh, but if we wanted to, we could go to the north pole. We could go to some, some points on the equator. So the NRHO is a very, very capable and valuable orbit. So that's why the gateway is using that. So. Hopefully I didn't uh, scare you off too much with the uh, orbital mechanics and my tennis ball. Uh, let's see what the gateway is made of, shall we? So the first gateway components or what we call elements are gonna be integrated for launch in 2024. That's the current timeline. Timelines are always fluid, but that's our, our teams are working hard to 2024. Um, Maxar is our commercial partner for the what's called the power and propulsion element or PPE. Um, and it does exactly what the name implies. It provides power and propulsion to the gateway. Uh, it's a 60 kilowatt class uh, spacecraft with 50 kilowatts dedicated to that solar electric propulsion that I was talking about earlier. And the other 10 kilowatts is dedicated to spacecraft power, the, the systems inside the spacecraft, as well as the communications and experiments. Um, Northrop Grumman is our commercial partner for the habitation and logistics outposts. Uh, you can think of that as the habitat. That's where the crew is gonna live. Uh, that's, it has multiple docking ports. So uh, those spacecraft that are coming up to visit the gateway and then land on the lunar surface, they can dock in multiple locations. It also has space for cargo and for science. As I said earlier, we're integrating those two pieces on the ground and we're launching them as one piece. What that does, it reduces risk for us uh, and enhances mission success. So if you look on the right hand of the slide there, you'll see a computer-aided design model of what we call the co-manifested vehicle or CMV. 
uh, in an ex what's called an extended fairing. So the, the spacecraft will be integrated together on the ground, and then the fairing will be put around the outside. The fairing, you can consider a cover that protects the spacecraft while it's in the Earth's atmosphere after launch. So we have to protect those, those critical components from the heat of the atmosphere while, while we're launching. Um, as I said, we're targeting for a, a launch no earlier than November 2024 on a Falcon Heavy rocket. And uh, as you can see there, it, it, is a, it is a massive rocket. And if you have never seen a rocket launch, put it on your bucket list. It is amazing. You, it is an experience. You feel it. You, you watch it, but you feel it and you experience it. So highly recommend seeing a rocket launch. Put it on your bucket list. Um, the solar electric propulsion that I was talking about before, um, it is, it's one of those innovative uh, technologies that I was describing before. Um, we, NASA has used solar electric propulsion on planetary probes like Dawn before. Uh, this will be the first human rated spacecraft to use solar electric pro propulsion. Um, if you think about normal rocket engines, you have to have a fuel. So you think back even further, in order to have fire, you have to have a fuel source, you have to have oxygen, and you have to have an ignition source. Um, big rockets, their fuel source is usually something like liquid ox or liquid hydrogen, liquid methane, um, what's called RP1, which is basically kerosene, and then liquid oxygen. Um, Solar electric propulsion is different. You have the fuel is a noble gas, usually like xenon, and you use electricity to what's called ionize. So if you go back to chemistry, you have your you have your nucleus and you have your your electrons going around the the nucleus. Um, what you're doing is you're pulling those pieces apart. You're ionizing the gas xenon and then you're using an electric field to push it out the back of the spacecraft. And just like uh, Isaac Newton, you have you know, F equals MA, or every action has an equal and opposite reaction. When you push something out of the back of the spacecraft, the spacecraft's gonna go forward. So it's not going to be fast quickly, but given enough time, you can make a spacecraft go really fast with SEP. And for things that we're doing on Gateway, where we're just making sure that the Gateway is staying in the correct orientation or the correct orbit, solar electric propulsion is perfect because it doesn't use a lot of fuel. Um, the things, if you're in aerospace engineering or if one of your, your students is in aerospace engineering, you can tell them you, what we always look at at NASA, we look at mass and volume and power. Those are the things that we're always trying to trade. So if you get a little bit more mass, you can actually build a bigger spacecraft. You can put more cargo in the spacecraft. So solar electric propulsion is very, very fuel efficient. Um, it's affordable and it can be adapted to other applications. Um, so solar electric propulsion is, is incredible and I can't wait to see, see a PPE fly. Um, we're also doing science on Gateway. And some of the early payloads that we're doing, we're doing with our international partners as well. We have the first two payloads on, on Gateway will be sponsored by NASA's Science Mission Directorate and our partners at the European Space Agency. Um, the European Space Agency experiment is a radiation experiment. So we're gonna test and see what kind of radiation is in that unique NRHO that I talked about earlier. And the NASA Science Mission Directory payload is going to explore the solar wind so we can see how the solar wind and space weather works outside of a magnetic field of Earth. Um, and we can also do these experiments even when there are no crew on Gateway. So that's another big plus to our payload capability. Another element of Gateway is our logistics services. Uh, the first U.S. commercial partner under contract is SpaceX. Uh, SpaceX going to deliver cargo experiments and other supplies to Gateway. So you see the Dragon XL uh, spacecraft there in the background. Uh, there are multiple logistics missions planned. Each one's planned to stay for about six to 12 months at the Gateway. 
each Dragon XL can deliver about five metric tons of cargo to the gateway. While in transit to the gateway, uh, the vehicle can provide power to the payloads in, in the pressurized cargo, as well as external payloads. Um, and we got to get rid of the trash somehow. So when the crew is done with uh, their all of the things that they need to do their experiments, they're going to put their trash in the vehicle. And just like Dragon for crew and cargo on ISS, this Dragon vehicle will be automated so it can dock and undock on its own. Another capability we're going to have is extra vehicular activity. Now, when you hear this on ISS, you think spacewalk. Um, when you hear of it in the Artemis sense, you can think of it as all of the things that encompass extra vehicular activity or spacewalks or moonwalks if you're on the surface. So it's spacesuits, it's the tools, it's the interfaces from the spacesuit to the vehicles, whether that's the human landing system or future lunar roving vehicles for surface mobility. Um, EVA enables human-led science on the moon. And while robotic operations, robotic probes are vital for our understanding and getting the data that we need to understand the solar system and the universe, some things really need those human hands to put on to do that science. The EVA spacesuits provide all of the life support functions for up to eight hours. Um, different from the current suits that we have on ISS, it supports multiple suit pressures up to 8.2 pounds per square inch. Um, that is different from ISS where it's, it's quite a bit lower. I believe it's close to four pounds per square inch. So when the astronauts get inside the suit, when they lower the pressure, they have to let their body kind of acclimate to that lower pressure. The human body can breathe in that lower pressure because it's, it's the percentage of oxygen is higher, uh, but we still need to kind of acclimate to it. Uh, increasing the pressure closer to what we normally feel on Earth, which is about 14.7 pounds per square inch here at sea level. Um, reduces the amount of time that they have to let their bodies acclimate to the suit. And also having a single uh, exploration architecture supports multiple destinations from low Earth orbit at the space station, lunar vicinity at gateway, surface operations to our exploration in deep space. And we couldn't do all of this without a lot of help from our international partners. Um, Going forward, we, NASA, embrace working with our international partners. We're building the gateway on the ISS partnerships to expand our deep space capabilities. Um, the Canadian Space Agency is providing the external vehicle robotics for the gateway, just like they have for the space shuttle and for the International Space Station. Our uh, European Space Agency partners are providing what's called the European Internet or the International Habitation Module or IHAB. So that'll be an expanded capability uh, in an additional phase of Gateway. And our Japanese partners at JAXA, they're providing uh, some more logistics and I believe some life support as well. So it, it is an international effort. Um, and I, I love that we work so well with our international partners. And so you've heard enough, or you've heard a lot about Gateway and, and Artemis. Uh, now I wanna talk about home. Um, what you see in the picture here is our home. Uh, it's, it's our planet. We only have one planet. We have to treat it well. Uh, however, if you look a little bit closer, you might notice that it's a specific part of our planet. Uh, and if you look at that little arrow at the bottom of the picture, I believe that's Muncie, Indiana, which is the home of Ball State University. Um, that may be your home. Um, you may have grown up in Muncie. Um, that may be your temporary home. That may be your home away from home while you're at college. Uh, home has taken on a new meaning in, in the world in its current state. And it's, it's always nice to think about what we call home. 
And I'd like to let uh, NASA astronaut Randy Bresnik or call sign Comrade talk a little bit about, about home. Home. For me, home is where my family is. But there have been times in my life where I was called away from my family for extended periods of time. While I was serving in the Marine Corps, it was hard to be away from my loved ones. But thankfully, I had my squadron family, but other places where we were stationed around the globe became a temporary home. Then, in 2009, I launched the International Space Station, traveling even farther away from my family. Conducting science 250 miles above the Earth, the space station was an orbiting home for my crewmates and myself. Talk about a room with a breathtaking view. With Artemis, NASA will send the first woman and the first person of color to the moon. We are going there for the benefit of all here. We'll need a place to orbit around the moon where we can live and work, a place where to get ready for our lunar surface expeditions, and a place to return to when our work on the lunar surface is complete. We need a lunar home away from home. This will be the gateway. Starting with the power and habitation modules, the Gateway will be the first long-term outpost in lunar orbit humans have ever had. Primed for new discoveries, this orbiting laboratory will provide us with a unique view of our solar system. And it's already becoming a beacon for the future of international and commercial cooperation in space. With increasing capability and longer missions over time, the Gateway will be a powerhouse of technology and science, paving the way for future human missions to Mars. Design and fabrication of gateway elements by NASA and our international partners is well underway around the world right now. Wherever you are on planet Earth, today you are part of the Artemis generation. I'm NASA astronaut Randy Bresnik, and I invite you to join us by following NASA Gateway on social media and telling us where you call home. Those videos always give me goosebumps. Have them right now. So join us. Tell us where you call home. Uh, follow Gateway on Twitter at NASA underscore Gateway. Uh, follow us on Facebook at NASA Gateway. And check out our website at nasa.gov slash gateway and nasa.gov slash suit up to find out a lot more information, more than I could ever have packed into this presentation. Uh, I really appreciate you spending some time with me at night, and uh, that's all I have for today. Um, that's the Artemis program. That's NASA, and we really appreciate you supporting us and helping us return to the surface of the moon and beyond. Let's explore together. Thanks. And I'll take any questions you might have. Uh, if you have questions that I don't answer, this is my real email address at NASA. Um, you can write it down. You can look back in the video if you want. Um, and with that, I will turn it back over to Dana. Thank you so much, Andy. That was a wonderful presentation. And we have a lot of um, interaction in the chat. So if you're just joining us or you joined just a little bit ago, I'm Dana Thompson, the director of the Brown Planetarium here at Ball State University in Muncie, Indiana. And I'm joined today with Patricia, who is NASA's Artemis, or on NASA's Artemis communications team, as well as Andy, who you just heard a wonderful presentation from. Um, so if you do have any questions, put them in the chat. We already have one from Matt. Um, and I actually wrote down the same question before Matt put it in the chat. And that is, will Gateway grow with modules like the International Space Station has over time? Or is it going to be more static? It will grow over time. Uh, initially, as, as I said in the presentation, the initial modules will be the power and propulsion element or PPE and the habitation and logistics outpost, HALO. Um, our international partners will be bringing up the IHAB. Uh, we already have our starting plans right now for an airlock similar to ISS. And we've built in the capability into the vehicle to expand over time if we want to add additional modules to the, or elements to the vehicle. So yes, it will grow over time. We built the capability into the vehicle and, and I can't wait to see it grow even larger than what you see on the screen. Great question, thank you.
Uh, Matt also commented that the uh, Viper acronym was one of NASA's top acronyms that they've ever <laughs> thought of. So I, I liked that as well. We love our acronyms at NASA. In fact, we have sometimes we do backronyms. So we come up with a with an acronym and then we figure out what we're going to make the words. So we love our acronyms. Thanks, Matt. And then I think it's uh, Beggy or Beggy uh, says, well done. Even I can understand all the science. And your nephew, uh, Karsten, I think, uh, is watching from California. So oh, welcome, BG. Karsten. Yes, Karsten. Hello. Thank you. I'm glad that I could explain it uh, down to a level that, that some people most, you know, I, I try to make that happen. Sometimes I fail miserably, but I appreciate that. So thanks for watching. All right. So, um, more questions here. We just saw the slide again with the international partners and we have the international space station. Um, and gateway is an international partner, like an international project. Um, are we kind of moving away from including international in the title of some of these things, just because it's becoming so commonplace that all projects are really international partnerships? I believe so. Uh, the, NASA wants to work with our international partners to create a, a better future for life here on Earth. And, and if we can make that happen with our international partners, then then that's what we're going to do. I don't know, Patricia, if you have anything to add to that. No, that was beautiful. Yeah, we we can't we always like to say we can't do it alone. You know, NASA's leading the efforts. We've got, you know, uh, thousands of commercial partners all across the United States and all of our and all of our um, states. And then we have lots of international partners too. So, um, so it's a, a team effort with NASA leading the way. Great. All right. Um, one of the last things you were discussing was about the spacesuits. Um, a lot of questions about spacesuits, right? Uh, one of the recent articles I've seen online, and I did not read it, um, unfortunately, but it says that some of the projects for space travel and exploration are actually being kind of slowed down because of spacesuit creation or some kind of limitation there. Um, do you know of any of those limitations or um, how really do the spacesuits maybe differ from the ones being used on the International Space Station? Are they tested yet in space? So the XCVA or Exploration EVA is, is the element that is, is building the spacesuits. Um, they have prototypes already in work doing testing in the labs here at JSC. Um, it, is, it is a hard problem um, to, to crack, but the we have obviously years of experience uh, in spacesuit design. The, the difference between the spacesuits that you see on the International Space Station outside when they do the, uh, the EVAs or the, the spacewalks outside are that they are not designed to, for surface operations. They are designed just for microgravity. Um, the suits themselves that for lunar surface operations need to be designed specifically for that purpose. So they have to be the specific, you know, the boots and the, the life support systems. Um, they can use some of that, what we call heritage technology or the things that we've already learned uh, from the Apollo spacesuits. Those do have to be redesigned for surface operations. So that is going to take a little bit of time. But we are working towards that 2024 launch date, and uh, timelines are always fluid. But we can, you know, we will we will be working towards those to, towards those timelines. And the teams are incredible, and I and I know they they will do incredible work and and meet those uh, expectations. Yeah, and you talked about the pressure that's needed, um, or capable like these spacesuits are capable of um so they're a little different of a pressure than the space station you said um mm -hmm. is that about four psi where these are about twice that um could you talk a little bit more about why they even need to be pressurized i know you know here on earth we're used to this air surrounding us and pressing on us um at this pressure all around us and keeping us alive right um mm -hmm. we kind of evolved to i think like that environment 
And what happens when we don't have that? And why is it important that the spacesuits are filled with air? Uh, it's important just because exactly what you said, the human body has evolved to live in one, what we call one atmosphere of pressure. So whatever metric or, or uh, standard that you use, whether it's PSI or millimeters of mercury or bar or kilopascals, there's a pressure that the human body has been evolved to, to live in. Um, when that pressure gets lower, if you remember your chemistry, the lower the pressure, that actually will lower the boiling point of liquids. So in essence, if you don't have pressure on your body, the liquids that are inside your body will start to, um, they'll start to change phase. Uh, so we need those pressures. Now we can live in, in lower pressures as long as we have oxygen. Um, if you're the, what you're breathing now is mostly nitrogen. I want, I want to say we're about 21% oxygen on the surface of the earth. Um, they're breathing pure oxygen in space, uh, if I remember properly. And so you can change what's called the partial pressure of the atmosphere of oxygen to still be able to breathe at that lower pressure. But it's more, it's, it's a, it's just like you said, it's an evolutionary thing. And because of what we're made of, if we don't have pressure, there will be not so good things happen to, to us. Yeah, very, it would be a very bad day. Um, so is their spacesuit isolated um, from their like helmet? Do they get different air in their helmet than they do their, their spacesuit? Do you know? I don't believe so. Uh, I believe I believe it's one whole volume. Um, you can think of you can think of the spacesuit as the human body is basically inside a big balloon, and it's all that one volume. So all of the atmosphere that's within the spacesuit is all over the body. Okay. Um, and I'm not a spacesuit expert. Um, I have some friends here that are spacesuit experts. Patricia, do you? Uh, did, I, I'm pretty sure that's that's fair. Yeah, right. you, you're you're saying it right. Um, I have a another really cool picture I'll show you guys too of of the astronauts training and some of our new prototypes um, suits too. But um, like you said, they're all one piece. Um, well, they all become one piece. A lot of the times, at least once on the space station, you have a lower torso piece, an upper torso piece, your gloves um, come off, you know, and so they can customize a little bit the sizes. So for short astronauts or taller astronauts and different size hands. So there are some customizable pieces, but they're made to work once they're all connected and everything is sealed, the PLIS or the primary life support system, the backpack is what generates the power and the, and the flow of air. And it's in it. You don't want it to break apart, right? You want it to all be one piece. So the air doesn't, doesn't leak out. It's interesting. And lots of hinges because it is, like Andy said, one big balloon basically, and you need something to help uh, be able to move inside of it. That's what's so different about this one than the one that we use on the space station, because they don't really need to move. They don't need to move like we would need to move on the moon. Um, they have to be able to wear it. It can't be too heavy. They have to be able to bend down and not topple over, mm. you know, so you have to think about all those things. And if you go back and you look at some old videos of the astronauts during Apollo, they're falling all of the time and they had a hard time getting back up. And so we don't we're trying to correct the, the, that situation. <laughs> a good idea um so speaking of the apollo missions they probably didn't go through as much testing i think as we're doing today for the artemis and gateway um it doesn't seem like it anyway but i wasn't around then um i don't remember the whole history of all the missions that came before the first landing and the next few landings um are they doing more testing and more kind of uh trial runs with these programs than they did back for Apollo? Are we being a little bit more safe this way? I I wouldn't say that we're doing more testing or less testing. I would say we're doing the, the methods and tools that we use have drastically changed since the 60s. Um, 
most of the components for the launch vehicles and the spacecraft, the capsule, the spacesuits, those were all done on paper. Those were all done with slide rules. Um, they, I don't even believe they had like handheld calculators to do those types of calculations. It was all done analog. So from a testing perspective, they, I don't know this for certain, but I believe that they would have done the same types of testing. It's just the tools that we use today are so much more advanced that we can test a lot more quickly so we can advance those designs much more quickly and get to a product that's going to be safe and we're going to be able to fly much sooner. So maybe basically the amount of tools and technology that they had, they did the appropriate amount of testing for that, but now it's expanded quite a bit and we're doing the appropriate amount of te testing for the expansion of technology and um, the advancement of it. It's just a lot more because exactly. I, I heard that they went to the moon with a computer that had less power than our cell phones today. Absolutely. That is, that is an accurate statement. All right. Um, a few more questions here. Uh, why the lunar South pole? Um, so I know that part of the lunar South pole is always in nighttime and then some of it is always in daytime, um, which means that there might be some frozen water in the nighttime side doesn't reach or get heated up by that sun. So that might be interesting. Um, but why, why really are they choosing this, the South pole location? Why not the North pole? Why not the equator? Well, that's th exactly what you said is one of the reasons. So um, recent studies have shown that there is a lot of water ice in the, the permanently shadowed portions of the moons inside the craters. Um, the, the equator, or I'm sorry, at, at the poles, not the equators, um, the equators are going to get some sunlight depending on which which or which part of the orbit that the moon is in. So sometimes those craters are going to get sun. And if there was any water ice in those craters, it would either evaporate or it would um, sublimate. So that's one of the reasons why. Um, it probably is because of the way that the orbit uh, that was chosen, the NRHO orbit, it's easy to get to the South Pole. We can get to the North Pole, but it's a little bit easier from my understanding to get to land at the South Pole. Um, and the reason we are so interested in water ice is because it can be used for fuel. It can be used, it can be melted for drinking water. It can be, um, it can be split, hydrogen and oxygen can be split apart and that can be used for rocket fuel basically. So when I was talking about the chemical rockets in the presentation, you need a fuel, which is hydrogen. You need an oxidizer, which is oxygen. So those craters that have water ice are very rich in resources that can be mined and used for future Artemis base, could be used for fuel depot in orbit near the gateway or on the gateway. So there are a lot of reasons why um, the South Pole is one of the places that we want to go. And that's why we're going there uh, in the first missions. And we've never been there before. So and we've never not? been there before. That's great. Um, highly recommend if you haven't seen it um, for all mankind. It's the it's the Apple TV plus series there. They actually land at the South Pole. So you can get if you watch that series, it's it can be NSFW. So if you if you have young children, be mindful of that. However, if you wanted to get a, a visual perspective on what it looks like at the South Pole of the Moon, they have some great images and great visuals. So highly recommend checking out that series. Great. Um, so one, one final question, um, unless anyone else has a question, put it in the chat. We'll make sure to get it uh, to Andy and Patricia here. Um, but one of the favorite, my favorite things to talk about when we have young children who come to the planetarium here, we talk about what do you need to go into space? 
And there's always the typical answer of a rocket ship, a toilet, a astronaut suit, a food and water, something to drink. Um, but our wants kind of get overlooked with that. But sometimes our wants are our needs, right? For psychological safety or just feeling, um, you know, comfortable and safe in space beyond uh, physically safe with protection against the elements and whatnot. Um, so what's what's that look like for the gateway program? I know the international space station, they're allowed to bring some things with them. Um, will they al be allowed to bring things with them? There's going to be people living there, um, for a little bit, right? Uh, what kind of steps are they taking to make sure that the astronauts are not just physically safe, but mentally safe as well? That is a great question. Um, the, so me personally, you know, I, I need those, you know, I need music. I love music. So that's one of the things that I would have to have. Um, and yes, there are the, uh, so on the ISS, there is a, you know, a crew package that, that each crew member is allowed. There's a certain volume and a certain mass that they're allowed to, to put in. They can be personal items. They have to be approved. They have to be safe, obviously. Um, they do have music in one, that's, that's separate. So they are provided. They say, I want this music to go with us they can do movies and digital digital media um, and that i haven't heard directly but i have to assume that that is going to be an essential item for those folks who are living that far away from the earth for that long um, you know some people will have their their special little you know when i was growing up it was a little stuffed hippopotamus <laughs> Some people like to have their, their blankie, you know, they have to have that stuff. And there is a lot of research being done at Johnson Space Center, as well as around NASA on psychological health of crew members. Um, they're doing what we call analog studies where uh, a crew will, will be sealed inside of a, a facility for, it could be a week, it could be a couple of weeks, it could be 30 days. NASA's uh, actually recruiting uh, participants right now for a year-long uh, analog mission. Uh, so if you're interested in that, uh, do a little Google search on that. But those types of experiments are the types of things that, that NASA is doing to ensure the mental health of the crew members uh, in those long journeys. So uh, that's a great question. And I would absolutely have to have my music I wanted to show you guys what that astronaut kit looks like. It's really small. <laughs> it, this is a one from, um, I think this is one from an early shuttle days, but it's it's pretty tiny. Um, of course, now this is their personal things, not their, you know, things they need for grooming or food or clothes. This would be like jewelry that they or small pictures they'd want to fly, you know, maybe a small, tiny stuffed animal. Um, but this is, this is, basically what they're allowed, um, unless they can negotiate more. <laughs> yeah, and that's five inches, not feet, yes. right? So five, yes, inches, five inches by eight it's inches very, by two it's inches. very small. So think five about inches. what you would take, you know, if you, if you could pack something special, what would it be? I'd have to take a picture of my son, my family, um, a picture of blue sky and some green, and uh, I would put that up uh, on the treadmill or whatever the exercise machine was up there while I exercised because I, I need exercise. We all need exercise, especially in, in microgravity, uh, but I need some of that kind of stimulation myself. So uh, great question. What about a cell phone? Um, do cell phones work in space? The cell phones that we traditionally use these do not work in space because you obviously you need an antenna to pick up the tower. signal. Yeah, a tower. Yeah. Yeah. We don't you, have satellites however, for phones, right? We have satellites for satellite how, phones, but yeah, yeah. Yes. However, um, on the International Space Station, they do have a voice over IP phone. So they on there's a they can pick up, it's on the what's called the station support computer. And they have headsets just like this, and they can log into the computer and they can call any number on Earth anytime they want to on the space station. 
Um, I would assume that there's probably going to be a limited version of that given the amount of data that it takes for a conversation. Probably won't be video. Um, and pro because there will be a delay, um, it's probably about a two to three second delay just for the communications to get from the moon back to Earth. So you would have to be very patient because as we've had to do these Zoom meetings, we've had to learn how to start and stop. You have to do that with those voice over IP communications. Um, quick, quick side note, um, if you've ever heard the little beep uh, when you hear mission control talking to the astronauts, either the lunar astronauts or the astronauts on the space station, you'll hear that beep. That's called a Quindar tone. And that indicates when the person is done speaking. So that will help with those type of communications. So I'm assuming they'll be able to do that um, in limited fashion. Yeah. Is the International Space Station's only about 270 miles above Earth's surface? The Correct. moon is what, like 100 times as far? Am I doing that it's right? About, it's about a quarter of a million miles. Yeah. It's a while um, away. It's a while away. And um, um, go ahead. The so in my previous job as a flight controller, I did the the support that I was saying for the networks. Uh, if we have any gamers listening or watching the video after this, um, gamers always talk about their ping times. What's your ping time? What's your ping time? Mm -hmm. um, the ping times from a computer on the space station down to mission control can run anywhere between a half a second and one second where your typical gamer is looking at the 20 millisecond, 15 millisecond time range. So it's it's quite a bit of delay. Um, Ray in the chat is asking how long each mission will take or like how long to rotate out? The current missions to Gateway are planned right now for about 30 day, what we call sortie or 30 day mission, um, depending on the logistics, you know, the gateway logistics services that I was talking about, they may be able to supply the gateway with a little bit more supplies. So they could, they are looking at currently studying how to lengthen that mission. But right now it's looking at about 30 day mission about every nine to 12 months. Well, thank you so much, Andy. Thank you, Patricia. A lot of information about the program is in the description of the YouTube video here, um, but we'll get some links added to the chat here before we um, sign off completely for the end of the day. So if you want to keep an eye on the chat or come back and watch the program again, we'll get that information there. But so much can be found just by Googling NASA Artemis program or the Gateway Project. Um, any last words here? I really appreciate the time to to share what we what we do at NASA. Um, it's your space program, and I am just honored to be able to represent and share the information that that we have gathered and the knowledge and and be able to hopefully inspire some other folks to to work in the space industry, whether you're an artist or a scientist. Um, do do what you love and if that's space come come talk to me and come talk work at nasa thank you we we want you to follow along with us we've got lots of great um handles and um on different platforms almost anyone that i think out there except for TikTok. <laughs> everything else i think we've got covered and so um just follow along and you'll stay in tuned with the biggest and the coolest things that we're doing we like to highlight all of our, our big major milestone moments and when our launches take place and what's coming in the future. So follow along and we'd love to have you. Right. Absolutely. Thank you again uh, to our guest speakers here, um, Andy and Patricia. And we're signing off here from Ball State University in Muncie, Indiana. Have a great night, everyone, and take care. Bye-bye.